Aimless and Equals is a £220 million profitable cash generative fintech business. It makes its money by selling what it says are scalable payment platforms which enable organisations to move and easily manage their money flows through uh, payment and card products. Ian Stratford-Taylor is chief executive and he joins us now. I say fintech, I say profitable. The two don't often go together, but you've managed to, to bring the two together in a business which, which makes good money for investors. Tell us a bit more about your business model. Yeah, it's a good point because people always ask me who our competitors are and there is no obvious competitor to exactly what we do. And as you mentioned, a lot of fintechs are well capitalised by PE, generally not listed, lose money, it's all about scale and we bring something different. We see ourselves slightly between the incumbent banks and we still take a lot of business from them. That's really not the enemy, but that's where we're taking the business from. And the fintechs on the other side, which tend to be one product, you know, a platform that you have to use yourself as no one to help you. We're kind of in the middle. So we can bring the best of what a bank does and the best of what fintechs don't do into a profitable business that's self-sustaining with people you can speak to with a 15-year longevity and track record and it's a listed business. So that's kind of a unique uh, proposition. What we do it contrast to what we used to do we listed when we listed in 2014 we were called fair effects we were very much a retail dominated business around travel cards and foreign exchange and you may obviously remember that around 2016 17 revolut monzo these types mm -hmm. of businesses came along doing what we did as a way to acquire customers and doing it for nothing so freemium model and we realized we had to pivot away from being a b2c business to a b2b so servicing corporates, not necessarily uh, retail consumers, and also building the platform that we've assembled over that time that we can sell directly to customers, so corporate customers, or allow other corporates to use our platform to sell to their customers, so white labeling and that type of stuff. And that's really, in a nutshell, what we do. So we're not an FX business anymore. We do FX. Yeah. It's a core part of what we do. It's our legacy and heritage but it's not all, we, all that we do. And of course, then shortly after that came COVID. Uh, we'll look at the share price in just a moment, but I mean, the COVID uh, downturn, you must have thought perhaps maybe that was the end of the Well, uh, I recall that well. And um, obviously then the, the KPI for everybody looking at us was, would we run out of cash, right? Mm. So it was all about cash preservation. And actually we weathered that storm very well. If you think about it, it was really what sort of march 2020 when that uh, started to clobber and people still thought that we were the travel money business that we used to be and of course we weren't anymore so our reliance on that whilst we took a hit in terms of revenue from that that wasn't all that we did we'd already moved to pivot over to b2b so whilst it was back down the hatches and uh, quite a tough time we all took salary sacrifice which we managed to pay back from uh, from uh, our results since, and, and it was a tough time. In some ways, it leaned the business down and you learn to get more efficient. So it was bad, but sort of healthy, cathartic maybe, um, and enabled us to show that we could survive that. And then the upturn since then has been quite dramatic. So how have you grown? Has it been mainly by organic or have you been acquisitive? I mean, you've had this big strategy shift and and, um, and and what's gone on along with alongside it? Big growth, or oh, forty five percent, I think, the last numbers you got out. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the numbers we posted for uh, last year, were more than double the two. So, two so years does before. that include the acquisitions and and, a bit, and so forth? Uh, mostly, so. it's been organic. A right. key thing for us, which is a bit complicated to explain, but I'll try. I tried to do it, which we unveiled in May twenty twenty one. And sorry, I have to ramble on a bit here, but um, essentially. We as a business, um, when we were an FX business, it tended to be that all the people who were doing FX would wire money into what we called a pooled account. So one account in our name, mm. they'd wire it to us with a reference number, hopefully. We'd have to work out who sent us what, do the right thing with that money and send it somewhere. It's quite complicated and messy. And it all comes into one account per currency at a bank. And for us, we thought, well, how much easier would that be? Instead of people wiring into one account, they wire into an account that's in their name, not in our name, on our books. So it's called an own name account. Mm. And also how much simpler would it be, instead of wiring into an own name account, one per currency, just one account that does all currencies. Mm. That's what's called an own name multi-currency IBAN. Bit of a mouthful, but you get the idea. And we unveiled that capability in May 2021. Mm -hmm. 
And if you look at our revenues since that point, well, that's, that's where that's come from. The ability to offer any corporate, be they large or small, an account in their own name that does everything. And by the way, from those same pots of money in this one account, they can pay out by bank transfer or pay on a card. If you're paying Amazon Web Services, Google for pay-per-click, you have to pay by a card. You can't mm. pay by transfer. You can do it all in one place. Yeah. So whether you're an SME or a large corporate, we're solving a problem for you. That's really what it's all about. Yeah. So what you used to presumably um, charge a spread on, on, on money going around, but now you can white label your products. We can white label it. We can, um, we're not, yeah, we're not reliant on FX. We will still charge a spread on FX, but we can, we can bill in many different ways. We can mm. charge transaction fees. We can charge just to move money around. It depends on the scale of the customer and the type of customer. And if they're using cards, then we earn a thing called interchange. Yeah. So the actual revenue model is quite complex. I can't say we earn money from just FX because yeah. we don't. But you presumably you've got more visibility on your trajectory for, for revenue now than you've ever had before, which I guess is part of this reason why you're growing. Yeah, and over time we're trying to move away from being, you know, oh, there's volatility in the FX markets, we make some money more towards annuity-based transaction fee type revenues, which again, the market likes because they can look out with a bit more certainty. Geographically, how you spread now, because I was reading somewhere you've, as a Belgian was mentioned in one, one news yeah. headline I saw recently. So you are now abroad. We're, well, we're still, as we sit here now, very much a UK centric business, right. UK centric customers. Mm. Um, and if you look at the growth we've had and the growth that we want to have going forwards, one way to get that is to expand your total addressable market or TAM, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so we realised we needed to go to other jurisdictions. The most logical is Europe. Um, there was a business in Belgium that basically had all the licences we'd want. If we were starting from scratch, this is what it would look like mm. um, that we were opportunistic enough to buy. So we're in the process of connecting that up and getting all the regulatory permissions from the local regulator that we need such that we can start to do the same there that we've done here that we should be ready to start putting serious business through there you know by the end of this year mm. spoke a lot about the growth the improvements and so forth and where all this is coming from are you having to squeeze margins um with that growth touch wood not yet um i think the difference is foreign exchange as we were is very there's a lot of providers are all fighting it's something of a race to the bottom in terms of spreads I'm not so interested in that. I'm interested in offering a service that a corporate is happy to pay for. So it's less spread sensitive, it's less margin sensitive as we sit here now. What we offer is replicable mm. um, and some people are trying to do it, but we have a head start. It's all about time. If I had an unlimited budget and started from scratch today, it would take at least two years to replicate what we have, maybe longer. Mm. So that's what we have to keep investing because really what we're taking is the complex account structure you get from a bank that we have. We have over 750 bank accounts with various banks and all single currency. Take that, apply technology, also invest in direct integration to payment networks where you can, such that a customer gets one look over the whole thing. It's simple and we move the money quickly for them, which reduces their working capital requirement. That's not easy to replicate. Mm. How does the, um, the current macro background fit into what you're doing? Are you disturbed at all by high inflation? I mean, there's a, a lot of people feeling the squeeze at the moment in their own personal pockets. And corporate's the same, I guess, to some degree. Does that impinge on your operations at all? It does to the extent that I think the difference is we're having a great year. We could have maybe have a fantastically great year if, if it wasn't for that. So. Uh, we're gaining market share, which kind of offsets that. But to the extent that business confidence is impacted, um, for sure that doesn't help us. You know, pe um, people transacting less, more, less business going through businesses, uh, uncertain whether to, you know, let's say they're in an, imp an importer, whether to hedge their exposure mm -hmm. a year out, or we're seeing people do it f for shorter durations, which affects revenues. So yeah, there is an impact. I mean, uh, we'd rather, the situation in Ukraine and Middle East weren't happening at all. Um, I think we all do for many, many reasons. Mm, um, but uh, yeah, if it impacts confidence, that's a pain for us because we are reliant upon the flow that people put through us. Mm. Essentially, 
you know, the more flow that goes through us, the more money we make. It's yeah. that simple. Let's um, let's bring up a share price chart uh, just to show people what has been going on. I mean, it has been. And this this goes back to the lows we had. What uh, we were talking about this before we went to air. Twenty pence down. What was it? Uh, March twenty twenty, which caused the COVID lows. It's been pretty much. I wouldn't say one directional travel, but it's been a pretty much good straight line. What is the um, what's been the motor behind this? Is it your tr- uh, change of strategy? Is it your growth? What do you as a board? What do you put this down to? <laughs> Well, I think the low was overdone, right. um, and if you look back, we had the kind of double whammy of um, slightly disappointing numbers for 2019, which impacted the share price. So the confidence in the stock was down a bit, and mm. then COVID came on top Oof. of it, yeah. and people thought we were a travel money business. So we kind of you end up in the doghouse a little bit when mm. you miss numbers on AIM. So you have to win back that credibility. You have to have numbers out there that are sensible, that you show you can reach or beat. We've done that consistently. And so I think that first trundle up does that. Then, as I mentioned, in May 2021, you could see the change in growth trajectory from uh, the revenue side of the business, which kind of produced the next bit of that graph. Um, I wish it was a straight line because every time it goes down, I'm getting the, why is the stock price down? I don't really know. I just say, you, you own, I'm just looking through the list, actually, you own one point, almost 1.2% 1. of shares. So you have a a nice healthy interest in this. I, I own that. I have um, several tranches of options or long-term incentives yeah. on top of that. So yes, I do have a healthy interest. And actually on that point, what we started a couple of years ago is a company-wide SIP program. So all people who have been with us for 12 months or longer all have shares and some uh, more broader based long-term incentives. So mm. quite a lot of my senior executives have shares, which mm. I think is important. So we're all sharing in the same uh, joy when it goes up and pain when it goes down. Um, so I say there's two legs to this. Maybe from 20p up to 60p is kind of where it should have been anyway. And then the run from there is the sort of 2021 change in trajectory mm. on revenues. Let me, let me just pull the top of this chart down because we've got a red dotted line up here, which I'm interested to talk to you about because that represents a price target. I think from Canaccord, Peel, uh, a couple of brokers with that sort of price target area up here. How do you feel about that? I mean, you know, you've got no control over the share price, as you've explained, but that is quite a lot of premium built into where we are. How are you going to get there? What's the what's that telling us, first of all, about the business? Are, are we not representative of what you've got at the moment, do you think, at current price? I think, you know, listen, for me as the chief exec, do I want the share price to overrun? As you can make an argument, it did, you know, in the early part of that chart there. No, I don't. You know, I, I want it to be at a what I would consider to be a fair price. But I think that 176 is not an unfair price, given everything we've we've got going on the quality of our growth, the strategy, the increased addressable market that we now have. So I still feel the stock is undervalued. Um, So partly it doesn't scare me because it's kind of where we ought to be. I don't think the market gives enough credit for the value of what we've built. It's just purely a multiple of earnings. And as more and more drops down to... uh, EBITDA and PBT and earnings per share over with operational gearing, I think that will take care of itself. So the, I think less will less be viewed as what was your revenue growth and more about your profit growth mm-hmm. now, which is not an unhealthy mm-hmm. position to be in. And we uh, announced our intention to pay an inaugural dividend, yeah. um, which I think also will attract new buyers. It technically in. takes you from a growth company into an income company. What, <laughs> what sort of uh, levels of, of dividend yield are you talking about? I mean, uh, we, we plan to yeah, announce plan. The, the policy yeah, right. once from the board once everything's gone through. So we had the EGM where the shareholders approved the movement of the reserves such that they can be distributable. We have to go through a court process as well to do it. So mm. at that time, we'll announce more fully what the dividend policy will be. But we've indicated that the initial dividend would be one and a half P. Um, and so we'll take it from there. Yeah, OK. Um, Look, we've got to wrap it up. Uh, just one final question. Where are you going to be in a year or so's time? 175 pence. <laughs> For sure. I, listen, I, I look forward. I know, and I, know, I know you can't say that. Yeah, it, 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 but I look forward with that. confidence when I see the pipeline of business that we have coming in. So, um, yeah, we should, you know, we will continue to grow. I can tell you that much. Um, so hopefully the market will, uh, will see the benefit in that. Yeah, and it's a pleasure. Thanks indeed for joining us. Thank you. From Equals Group. It's Ian Stratford-Taylor, the chief executive of the company, uh, talking us through some of the recent developments, the business.